A few days ago, video cards showed what is supposedly a leaked picture of a Renoir desktop chip, and it included its name, the R7 4700G. This desktop version of the Renoir APUs and laptops now, by my estimates, if this leak is correct, should perform a solid 5-10% to better in CPU tasks than the 4900H, but then also up to 15% better in APU gaming due to its 2.1 GHz blistering core clocks. And so when I consider the specs of the desktop version of Renoir, I think we could be looking at self-contained APU gaming performance around a GTX 1050, and then on the CPU side of things, the laptop version of Renoir isn't that far behind the significantly higher power usage using 3700X. With these higher desktop clocks, it might edge out the 3700X and even approach the 3800X. And yeah, I know this news came out a few days ago, but there are some conclusions I thought people may draw and start discussing that I'm just not seeing right now. So I want to give some insights into some of the repercussions of this being an R7 branded 4700G. What insights, you may ask? Well, as usual, I'm going to take a step back so you guys can see where I'm coming from. Um, when the 3300X was announced, I was quite surprised, as many people know. I didn't think AMD would launch low-end Zen 2s until... I don't know, maybe the end of this year. I thought they would pump out those 12 nanometer 1600 AFs and 1200s around the $100 price point for much longer. But that's not what happened. The 3300X was launched to humiliate Comet Lake and also, I think, to prepare for phasing out Global Foundry supply sooner than people expect. Now, the 3300X had four cores and eight threads. That's double the threads of the previous gen's 2300X with four cores and no hyper-threading. So I expected the 40, let's say 300X may come with six cores, six threads, right? Every generation increasing thread counts here and there just a little bit. You know, even the Zen Plus generation had 32 core Threadripper introduced and that wasn't in the Zen 1 generation. But... Honestly, I don't know that that's going to be the case anymore when I see them giving a low-end APU R7 branding. I thought the desktop Renoir would be a 4600G or hopefully a 4500G. Remember, the 3500X is six cores, six threads. So I was hoping they would elevate that to say either eight cores, eight threads, and then like a 4600G that's eight cores, 16 threads, you know, moving up thread counts in the 600 series and maybe even 700 series of processors. But it seems like it's not to be. Video cards has an excellent track record and it doesn't really matter if AMD intended Renoir to be low end when they conceived it. No, I think they've seen that this initially intended to be low end processor has resolutely and completely decimated all of Intel's offerings. And so there's no reason for them to get hyper aggressive with the Ryzen 4000 desktop lineup. Now, I have covered why Renoir is impressive in many videos in the past. You can go watch those. But one thing I never really covered that I do in this video is that Renoir has a higher cycle read and write rate between its CCXs due to it being a monolithic design compared to desktop Matisse. And I believe that this is why we sometimes see it get what looks like higher IPC than Matisse, despite having one-fourth the L3 cache. And it does, in my opinion, hint at what's coming from Zen 3. Right, you see where I'm going with this? If Renoir is able to make up mostly for having one-fourth the cache with this almost unified CCX design, what do you think is going to happen with a fully unified CCD and Zen 3 that has the same cache as Matisse. I think these rumors coming out about a very good at gaming Zen 3 are most likely very true. And I've, I've said that for, I mean, really a year now. You know, Zen 3 should increase single threaded IPC by around 15%, but it should also bring higher clock speeds and single threaded IPC is different from multi-core IPC. Being unified, we could be seeing an all-core IPC increase of, I think, up to 20% or more. 
So take the current around $150 to $200 R5-3600, the 6-core, 12-thread, Zen 2 gaming budget champion right now. If that, right, if there was a 4600X that was 20% higher multi-core IPC, 15% higher single-threaded IPC, and then it also came with slightly higher core clocks, I'm sorry, that's a gaming champion. And that's something AMD is going to capitalize on. And this is where we get to the main point of my video. Desktop versions of Renoir have been rumored, well, you know, since Renoir was announced for a laptop. And a lot of people were wondering, would this be a 3500G, a 3600G? Where is AMD going to put it? And I said two things. Number one, I just think Renoir's performance is too disruptive to fit into the existing desktop Ryzen 3000 series lineup. I just don't know where you slot it in when there's already Picasso and these other processors here. So yeah, seeing the 4000 branding, it seems I was right about this point. However, it seems I am wrong about how aggressive AMD will need to be, or not really need to be, but I was hoping they would think they need to be, right? When I see 4700G, to me, this signals that they're likely going to slot this in instead of a 4700 X because it should perform as well as a 3700X, if not possibly slightly better, and then it gives you integrated graphics. And I know that there's a six core 12 thread version. I think instead of a 4600X at launch, we could be looking at a Renoir based six core 12 thread 4600G, and then the four core eight thread version will probably once again be the 400, so the 4400G. And honestly, this isn't confirmed, but it would make a mountain of sense when you consider that everyone agreed the 3800X and 3700X were too close to each other in performance. So here you go. Here's the 4700G. It has integrated graphics, and it's basically just slightly better than the 3700X, if, even if you don't need the graphics. Um, I actually think they might price this below what the 3700X launched at, probably somewhere between $250 and $300. And then they can justify it. They can justify the 4800X being a full 8-core, 16-thread Zen 3 processor that costs, you know, 20 to 30% more, but is about 30% better. I mean, let's get real here. If Zen 3 really does bring even just a 10 to 20% IPC increase with higher core clocks, it's going to be the best gaming processor architecture. And I just don't think AMD wants to let you get what would de facto be the best gaming processor for $200. They know time and time again, enthusiast gamers are willing to pay $350 for a nine, or even $400 for a 9700K, even though it doesn't even have hyper threading. And they'll pay exorbitant prices for the 9900KS. And then remember just how close a 6-core Zen 3 would perform next to an 8-core model in gaming. A hypothetical 6-core 4600X would also likely perform within a few percentage points of the 4800X in games, at least at launch. And so, yeah, they want you to pay $400 to get the top gaming performance. And if you want to save money, well, the 4700G is better than the 3700X but it's just not for the top-end gamers. And if Rocket Lake impresses, AMD reserves the right to just release a 4650X 6-core Zen 3 or a 4750X 8-core Zen 3. But they don't need to do it at launch, and Renoir is dirt cheap to manufacture, so might as well just use Renoir for the 4600 and 4700 product lineups. That's what I think's going on when I see R7 4700G. And the funny thing is this theory also lines up with them requiring B550 or X570 for Zen 3. They know top-end gamers will also just buy the newest motherboard chipsets. Intel fanboys have proven this time and time and time again. And you know, it's really AMD's prerogative to do this. They've been climbing up this hill against an anti-competitive Intel for decades now. And now they have a chance to really resolutely take the last crown that they've been coveting, the top gaming performance crown. And with winning this final performance crown, AMD knows this is it. 
they can make as much money as they want to to fill up a war chest and prepare for whatever Intel's going to throw at them in a few years. And from that point of view, I suppose you could argue it may be a good thing for long-term competition. But if this is true, and keep in mind, a lot of this is still speculation, based on rumors I think are likely true, but speculation nonetheless. If this is true, and you ask me, you can see it, can't you? Just that little bit of milking coming out of AMD, little more than before. Just like what you saw out of Intel with Sandy Bridge. You know, Sandy Bridge is remembered as this godlike victory for gamers, but it did raise prices, right? Like the i7-920 was usually around 280 bucks when Sandy Bridge launched, and the i7-2600K became, well, 350 if I'm remembering correctly. You know, this is just that little bit. Despite Sandy Bridge having a smaller die, it cost a little more. That's because Intel knew they had ended all arguments. They were mostly in control of everything for years, but Sandy Bridge ended the conversation. And I believe Zen 3 is going to be when AMD ends the conversation for a few years, and they, they're going to try to make money from it. As I've been saying for a while in previous videos, Alder Lake is truly shaping up to be Intel's last chance to not be laughed out of the desktop gaming market. But the sad thing is, it's not going to have to beat just 7 nanometers Zen 3 above Renoir. It's most likely going to be competing with Cezanne or even 5 nanometer Rembrandt Zen 3 Plus APUs under Floyd Zen 4 with DDR5 support, according to Gamers Nexus' most recent rumors and other things seen on Twitter. Good luck, Intel. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. As always, I will say if you've been enjoying my videos, please remember to share them and please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, also remember there is a podcast every week, Broken Silicon. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and give us a review if you have a chance. And then finally, all this is really made possible by the patrons and they get ad-free early access to Broken Silicon every week and exclusive podcasts really every week as well. In addition to be able to submit questions and reader mail to the podcasts and loose ends and, you know, interviews I do, you know, there's really a lot going on at Moore's Law is dead. Don't miss it. And of course, thank you for watching. <laughs>